So the title of my talk is um, uh, the, the title of my talk is uh, Three Stages in the Use of Cost Benefit Analysis as a Tool for Evaluating U.S. Regulatory Policy. So cost benefit analysis uh, has had a constant, has been a constant significant feature of the U.S. administrative state since the early 1980s. But its sources of support and opposition have varied significantly uh, during these three decades. Uh, over the past 30 years, um, the, do we need this? Can you hear me? Yes? Uh, over the past 30 years, uh, the appeal of cost benefit analysis has to some extent shifted uh, from one side of the political aisle to the other. Now this process did not happen gradually, but rather there were two points at which a marked shift happened, dividing the period into three distinct phases. In the first stage, uh, the Republican Party adopted cost benefit analysis uh, as a way designed to slow and sometimes stop agencies from promulgating regulations. Uh, early in his first administration, President Reagan issued Executive Order 12,291, which required agencies to prepare the detailed cost benefit analysis of any proposed regulation that had a significant impact on the economy. This requirement succeeded in creating a serious drag on the regulatory process and was reviled by progressive groups. The second stage did not begin until a few years ago, when some progressive groups finally began to use cost benefit analysis to their advantage by providing analysis in place to monetary value and the health and environmental benefit of regulation. Uh, this attitudinal shift, I was involved in this shift, it was due in part to efforts that I undertook with one of my former students, Michael Livermore, when we founded um, an, an entity called the Institute for Policy Integrity, which is an institute at NYU Law School founded in 2008. Uh, the Institute made its, its mission to prompt progressive groups to take up the language of cost benefit analysis and to use it as a tool to further their agendas. Shortly thereafter, um, a different thing happened. Uh, conservatives, perhaps sensing a shift of power, began to lose interest in cost benefit analysis, turning the rhetoric away uh, from uh, cost benefit analysis and reframing the debate uh, over regulatory policy as one involving primarily the impact on jobs. Particularly in this election year, conservatives seem to speak of nothing but jobs in an attempt to define it as the most critical issue of our time. This new focus on jobs and the lean away from cost benefit analysis on the part of conservatives defines what I call the third stage that we're now in. How jobs analysis fits into regulatory decision making is an issue that will play a role in the upcoming election. Conservatives have been arguing that whether regulation, usually an environmental regulation, kills jobs, as they say, is a consideration that should trump all others. And they have been using models that vastly overpredict the negative impact of regulation on jobs. But the effect of environmental regulation on employment is simply one consideration to be taken into account and measured against all the others. Um, and also, if we're going to look at the impact of regulation on jobs, we need to make sure that the models used to make these predictions are sound. The conservatives are right in one way. The potential for regulation to have both positive and negative impacts on employment should be recognized in any well-conducted cost-benefit analysis which has not traditionally been the case. Despite the recent criticism from the right, uh, as well as those from the left three years ago, uh, cost benefit analysis remains a significant tool for evaluating regulatory policies, and my prediction is that it's likely to remain that uh, for uh, a very long time. So let me talk now about the first stage. Uh, so as I indicated, cost benefit analysis first hit the political stage uh, when the Republican Party adopted it as a way of constraining regulation. This process began during Reagan's campaign, when he cast regulation and the federal bureaucracy as the enemy of economic growth, positioning his agenda of deregulation and tax cutting as a key to creating jobs and increasing prosperity. Within a month of his inauguration in 1981, Reagan issued Executive Order 12,291, 
which asserted significant presidential control over the administrative apparatus. Reagan's executive order created the essential architecture of the central review of agency action that is in place today and has been in place ever since 1981. It required agencies to prepare detailed cost-benefit analyses of proposed regulations with a significant impact on the economy, and in general, required that regulations expected benefit exceed its costs. Officials within a new agency called the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, we, we call it OIRA for its initials, which is placed within the, the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, oversaw the cost benefit analysis process. And OIRA became known at the time as the black hole for regulations. Uh, many progressive groups fought back by rejecting the validity of cost benefit analysis altogether claiming that it suffered from fatal technical and moral problems. Now, interestingly, in 1993, President Clinton issued a new executive order, 12,866, which updated Reagan's plan that a wire perform an economic analysis for every major federal regulation. Clinton's executive order maintained the same architecture of cost-benefit analysis-based regulatory review creating at that point the bipartisan consensus on this requirement. But the Clinton order was greeted with similar distrust by pro-regulatory groups. I became particularly interested in the political side of cost benefit analysis about 15 years ago when I served on an advisory committee of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency uh, on environmental economics. I had written for several years about technical questions concerning the valuation of environmental benefits, arguing, for example, that ancillary benefits, um, like particulate matter co-benefits associated with greenhouse gas reductions, should be given equal consideration to the countervailing risks that had so frequently been discussed in the literature at that time. During those meetings, I realized there was severe imbalance in the participation in proceedings related to the use of cost-benefit analysis. In these committee meetings, we were discussing important questions like the right estimate for the value of statistical life, which is the single most important number uh, that guides the evaluation of regulatory policy. Uh, we were discussing whether carcinogens should be treated in the same way as non-carcinogens uh, in terms of the valuation of, um, that should attach to the probability of being free from these risks. We were discussing what discount rate should be used for latent harms and whether the same discount rate should be used for environmental problems affecting future generations. These are all <coughs> very significant building blocks to properly conduct cost benefit analyses. Major trade associations representing polluters participated frequently in our meetings as they had a right to do that under the administrative procedures that govern these proceedings. And they were generally represented by sophisticated uh, Washington, D.C. law firms, always arguing for a lower valuation of benefits and less regulation. But no environmental group ever showed up to our proceedings. When I raised this issue with a friend who was a senior official at a major environmental organization, he recognized that from a strategic standpoint, the environmental groups in the U.S. were missing out on an important opportunity to affect policy. But he said that the various constituencies of these environmental groups, including their funders and members, were suspicious of cost-benefit analysis and that as a result, these groups would not participate in the process. Years later, I was giving a talk at the American Enterprise Institute and alluded to this experience. Someone from the back of the room asked me a question. It was Sally Katzen, who has ser had served as the OIRA administrator in the Clinton administration. She said during that time, she had tried to convince environmental groups that cost-benefit analysis could be a neutral tool and encourage them to participate alongside industry groups in methodological discussions concerning the evaluation of costs and benefits. Whereas industry groups were eager to participate in these conversations, environmental groups were not. Her experience was just like mine. The only difference is that she actually held a very important position uh, in the federal government, so this failure was even more short-sighted. Uh, we quote her in her book saying that eventually she just gave up trying to uh, get environmental groups uh, to be part of these conversations. <clears throat>
In 2008, uh, as Ruth mentioned, I published a book with a former student, Michael Livermore. Its title is Retake Rationality, How Cost-Benefit Analysis Can Better Protect the Environment and Our Health. It discusses how anti-regulatory academics and trade associations for polluters capture the processes for determining appropriate methodologies for conducting cost-benefit analyses. We argue that as a result of the absence of progressive groups in these debates, important methodological fallacies came to dominate the evaluation of both costs and benefits. A number of these methodologies that came to dominate the practice of cost-benefit analysis are not supported by economic theory or empirical studies and have significant anti-regulatory effects. And the body of our book discusses eight of those fallacies, and I'll just give you a quick flavor here. So one such example concerns the use of risk rate of analysis, a methodological approach that gained popularity in the late 1980s and early 1990s. The idea is that when we reduce some risk regulation, we tend to increase others. So for example, we ban asbestos because it is a carcinogen. But then we have to use a substitute, less effective product as a fire retardant in ceilings, and so more people die in fires. But a common fallacy that tends to be embedded in this approach is that all collateral consequences of regulation are bad. In our book, we argue that serious cost-benefit analysis of regulation's impact should pay attention not only to the bad collateral consequences, uh, but also the collateral benefits of regulation, which are typically known as ancillary benefits. So here's a very common medical example. Aspirin, for example, has the unanticipated side effect of upsetting the stomachs, but it also has the unanticipated benefit of preventing heart attacks and strokes. So even though it's basically designed for people with colds, uh, many people spend good parts of their life taking small doses of aspirin uh, as a way to reduce the probability of heart attacks. And this is an a, um, an ancillary benefit. It's not the main, uh, uh, the main purpose of, of, of this medicine. Um, it turns out that the ancillary benefit associated with aspirin is probably greater uh, than its target benefit of reducing pain. On the environmental regulation front, uh, regulating conventional air pollutants like sulfur dioxide or particulate matter uh, tends to produce a shift in the electricity sector from coal to natural gas. And that has a significant ancillary benefit uh, of reducing greenhouse gases, which in this, my example, is not the target of, um, 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 is not the target of the regulation. So risk rate of analysis without considering ancillary benefits, which have been the norm, systematically biases cost-benefit analysis against regulation. A second thought methodological approach, which began to gain acceptance, concerns the valuation of lives saved as a result of regulation. The standard way to measure the benefits of saved lives is to look at people's willingness to pay to avoid health and safety risks, uh, which is then used to estimate um, what is known as the value of statistical life. Recently, however, there have been efforts to substitute the value of statistical life with the value of life years saved. Uh, and to determine the value of a life here by dividing uh, the value of statistical life uh, by um, the expected uh, life expectancy of the individuals who are subjects to the study. Uh, under the life years methodology, because older people will on average lose um, uh, fewer life years when they die, their lives are assigned a much lower value. The life of a 40-year-old is then typically about four times more valuable than that of a 70-year-old. But it only makes sense to decrease the value assigned to mortality risk reductions to account for age if one's willingness to pay decreases as one ages in a manner proportional to the number of remaining life years. Uh, but there is neither theoretical nor empirical support for this proposition. In fact, as people age, they can anticipate fewer life years, and because of this scarcity, we might expect that they would value their future life years more highly than <coughs> Moreover, as people age beyond age 40, their income tends to increase, typically also increasing uh, willingnesses to pay for goods. And the empirical evidence suggests that the rel relevant valuations are relatively constant from ages 40 to about 60, and then begin to decrease gradually, but at a much lower rate than the life year methodology would suggest. The life year methodology is therefore empirically unjustified 
and leads to the systematic un underestimation of the regulatory benefits of important programs. So those are two of the eight fallacies uh, that were discussed in the book, and I wanted to give you a flavor for what they are. And our point is that uh, the absence of one side of the debate in the regulatory process has led to um, these fallacies taking hold, taking hold and becoming the established methodologies. So the second stage. Um, so in 2008, around the time that we published um, our book, uh, Michael Moore and I started Policy Tech, which is a think tank, an advocacy organization at NYU Law School. Uh, our main purpose was to persuade progressive groups that they could meaningfully participate in cost-benefit analyses. Uh, due in part to our efforts at the Institute, pro-regulatory groups in general, and environmental organizations in particular, began to take an interest in the idea that cost-benefit analysis might advance their causes. Recently, there have been signs of a change in which progressive groups are finally starting to speak the language of cost-benefit analysis. And this is what I think of as a second stage in the evolution of cost-benefit analysis as a regulatory tool, the relative, relative embracing of this methodology by progressive groups. Over the past three years, policy integrity has done what it can to help this process along. To progressive groups that are willing to consider joining the fray, I tell them the following story about my time as a law clerk to Justice Surrogate Marshall on the U.S. Supreme Court. Justice Marshall believed that the death penalty was unconstitutional in all instances as a violation of the Eighth Amendment prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. In every death penalty case, uh, we inserted a standard paragraph explaining Justice Marshall's views. But he was only one of two justices who believed that, and so those cases were decided the other way on a 7-2 vote. So he always lost. Uh, but every once in a while, we had a case in which Justice Marshall believed that even a justice who did not share his views should vote to set aside the death sentence because of some specific problem in the trial or in the sentencing proceeding. In those cases, we still publish a standard paragraph, but then we would write a draft of an opinion aimed at obtaining at least five votes, which sometimes happened. I encourage progressive groups to do the same thing with respect to cost-benefit analysis. At regulatory proceedings, they could begin by briefly by explaining why they disapprove of the use of cost-benefit analysis. But then, we could quickly move on to explaining how it should be done, what methodology should be used, how costs and benefits should be evaluated. We have partnered with many groups um, to help them use cost-benefit analysis to their advantage, and I'll give you a few examples. Uh, responding to requests from the Center for Reproductive Rights, we prepared an assessment of cost-benefit analysis the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services conducted in support of a so-called midnight regulation promulgated at the end of the George W. Bush presidency, which made it more difficult for women to obtain reproductive health services. With Public Citizen, we filed an amicus brief in a case challenging a Bush administration deregulation that allowed truckers to spend more hours behind the wheel, risking additional accidents from fatigue. Building on research conducted by our colleague, Professor Rachel Barco, among others, we expanded our work into the area of criminal justice reform. By focusing government resources on those interventions that deliver the greatest public benefit at the lowest expense, cost-benefit analysis can provide a much needed corrective to criminal justice expenditures that pose significant pressures on state budgets. Our research has stressed that federal rulemakings on prisoners' safety must consider the benefits of avoiding recidivism, litigation, and healthcare costs, along with the cost of compliance. With regards to the environment, we have worked with the National Wildlife Federation to examine the harmful effects of the National Flood Insurance Program. We found that the policy redistributes wealth across income groups, and that middle-income areas are least likely to benefit, while relatively wealthy areas tend to be the largest beneficiaries of the federal program. So it's redistribution up to the rich. In partnership with the Environmental Defense Fund, we developed public comments regarding the value of government rules and for greenhouse gases, suggesting that relevant agencies should attempt to quantify the potential loss of consumer welfare and use distribution analysis to address the resulting energy security gains. 
Earlier this year, along with several distinguished colleagues, we sent a letter to the Obama administration urging it to stay its course in updating the social cost of carbon, uh, which is an estimate of the uh, harmful impact of, on uh, climate change of carbon emissions. Uh, we urged them to use the best available science, uh, as it originally had planned to do, but was under pressure to abandon uh, from, uh, from the right. Toward that end, in collaboration with the National Natural Resources Defense Council and the Environmental Defense Fund, two leading environmental groups, uh, we hired a climate change economist to work with us to update the way in which the social cost of carbon is calculated. Uh, Professor Douglas Kaiser from Yale Law School did a response uh, to a piece I did last year in the Houston Law Review, uh, which made our progress particularly visible. The article discussed how the issues raised in our book uh, had developed in the two years following the publication of the book. Professor Kaiser, a Yale faculty member, is also a member of the Center for Progressive Reform, an organization that has exhibited unvarnished antipathy toward cost-benefit analysis. But in commenting on our piece, Professor Kaiser wrote, assuming Livermore and Revez are correct that cost-benefit analysis is here to stay, and I have no reason to doubt their prediction. Then proponents of environmental, health, and safety regulation should do well to start talking the talk as best they can. That statement represented a significant ideological shift for the progressive left. Last year, Public Integrity formed a clinic that Mike Livermore and I direct, which trains law students on how to participate in the regulatory process and evaluate the administrative records produced by agencies. We hope that through the clinic, we will train future public interest leaders to participate intelligently in the regulatory process. Whether it's through commenting on regulations during the notice and comment period, sending policy recommendations by way of letters to the agencies and to all, or by producing scholarly works that can influence the way policy is made. The students have been absolutely phenomenal. They've tackled complex regulations on a range of issues, cooling water intake rules for power plants, fisheries enforcement, labor requirements for fuel efficiency, and so on. Their work product has really been exemplary, and agencies have been paying attention. For a fuel economy labeling rule, we were one of only two groups out of several thousand commenters that the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. Department of Transportation named the text of the final rules preamble, indicating they took our comments seriously, over, even though in that case they actually did not follow our recommendations. With regard to a rule regulating greenhouse gas emissions from heavy duty trucks, these agencies considered our comments and tend to be agreed to add a labeling program to future rulemakings. Our comments likely also help and support the U.S. Department of Energy's life cycle policy, which considers the whole life cycle of impacts, including greenhouse gases when regulating energy efficiency, and also had an impact on New York City's boiler rule, which is phasing out dirty home heating oil. Our hope is that by focusing on cost-benefit analysis, we are speaking the language that agencies know and have come to trust. And we think the ability to speak that language will be a real advantage to our students in the future. Now, with a seemingly endless economic rod and resulting turn of the political discourse, most advocates of stronger environmental protection have started to understand the importance of using cost-benefit analysis as a tool. Um, moral arguments, however um, compelling they might have been, which I think is not very compelling in the past these regular proceedings, are less compelling uh, in this time of intense focus on the economy. And progressive groups have come to recognize the biggest groups have hired economists and taken steps to be involved in even the most detailed of cost-benefit questions. The value of statistical life, once provided as a crass manner of placing a dollar figure on the worth of a human being, is now beginning to take a place in the toolbox of progressive advocacy organizations. So this brings us to the third stage. So unfortunately, in the aftermath of the serious economic crisis that began in 2008, uh, the political right has been insistently calling for an end to new environmental protections. Rather than focusing on cost-benefit analysis, which has become losing territory for them in many respects, there has been an attempt to reframe the debate to one about jobs. 
The focus in jobs and the abandonment of cost benefit analysis on the part of the conservatives is what I see as a third stage. Alexander Volokh, a noted libertarian and professor at Emory Law School, also commented on the piece um, in the Houston Law Review that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and I had mentioned earlier in connection with Professor Kaiser's comment. Volokh said that libertarians had liked cost benefit analysis because they had believed that it would lead to less stringent regulation. But Volokh noted that if as a result of our work, cost benefit analysis could begin to be used by progressive to lead to more stringent regulations, then, this is a quote, libertarians should reconsider their tolerance of cost-benefit analysis and focus more on making their case for deregulation in moral terms. This flip in position surprised me, uh, but I felt this was perhaps for idiosyncrasy specific to Kaiser, the progressive, and Vala, the libertarian. Recently, however, I encountered this quote from presidential candidate Mitt Romney, who in his economic plan said the following, this is a quote. Where standards are put in place to constrain the issuance of regulations, such as requiring the use of cost-benefit analysis, which he thought was put in place to not to come up with the best regulations, but to constrain the issuance of regulations, they tend to be vulnerable to manipulation and also disconnected from the central issue confronting our country today, namely generating economic growth and creating jobs. The end result is an economy subject to the whims of unaccountable bureaucrats pursuing their own agendas. It would be interesting to hear what Romney's suggested alternative cost benefit analysis is. Over the years, progressive critics have continually been asked for their alternatives, and they have never really given an adequate answer. So for example, uh, most environmental contaminants are no threshold contaminants. They pose risks at every level of concentration. Lower concentration, less risk. Where should we stop? We can't go to zero. Zero would take us back to the Stone Age. We have to stop somewhere. Um, well, one way to figure out where to stop is to balance the, um, the consequences, positive and negative, of, um, of reducing uh, the risk further. That's precisely what cost benefit analysis does. Um, so progressive critics have, I don't think, have come up with a good uh, alternative way of looking at that simple problem. Uh, if conservatives also seek to ban new technique, it is fair to pose the same question to them. And it's also interesting to know that Romney, with his Harvard Business School training and Boston Consulting Group pedigree, is not the most obvious person to question the reliance on economic models. He actually made a lot of money uh, using such models. But the upshot is that although there was a brief moment in which it appeared that cost benefit analysis could be the agreed upon language of the administrative state and that parties could finally speak together. Instead, just as one side was getting on the cost-benefit train, the other side was getting off it, practically at the same station. Conservatives abandoned pushing cost-benefit analysis as a way of preventing regulation, as soon as liberals decided it could be used to bolster support for the regulations they wanted. This kind of reversal has happened before. Federalism used to be a conservative talking point in the United States particularly as it applied to the environment. When conservatives believed that states would not pass strict environmental laws in the federal government, federalism, which was empowering the states at the expense of the federal government, suited conservatives just fine. But when states started to pass progressive environmental laws ahead of the federal government, and in some cases in spite of the federal government, liberals began to talk about the virtue of state regulation and conservatives began to argue for federal preemption of state regulation. Commitment to principle consistently seems to take a second seat to preferences over regulatory outcomes. Conservatives may be more reluctant now, as I indicated, to talk cost benefit analysis the way they once did. But what is the alternative to cost benefit analysis? The alternative certainly can't be what the regulatory right is talking about now which is jobs analysis. Republicans have been keen to label as job killing practically any regulation that any agency proposes, especially those proposed by the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, while simultaneously knocking down cost-benefit analysis models that predict the number of lives that are lost as a result of pollution. This tech has been gaining, gaining steam. A Google search of, quote, job-killing regulations 
turned up close to 700,000 hits when we did this uh, search in April. And I'm sure if you, we did it now, it would be over a million. And this term was virtually not used before 2008. So it's kind of a new thing. And, um, and it's spreading like wildfire. But the idea of job cutting regulations is based on a one-sided model, a model with only employment costs and no benefits at all. Under this approach, it is better to be dead than unemployed, because a regulation that eliminates a job should not be adopted, even if it saves life. Moreover, the one-sided model approach is problematic, because the jobs models themselves are still in a somewhat primitive state. These models are intended to capture how different sections of the economy interact and what effect those interactions will have on jobs. But most models can look only at one part of the problem, like layoffs or hiring in a particular sector, and cannot model the dynamic economy-wide effects of a policy on aggregate employment levels. Because overall employment responds to large macroeconomic factors, individual environmental regulations will rarely have lasting effects on aggregate employment. Environmental regulations that do not affect marginal labor productivity in the economy in general are more likely to influence the geographic and sectorial distribution of employment opportunities rather than national employment levels. Current employment models are better suited to identify these effects than to forecast economy-wide consequences. While this information may be useful for policymakers, it should not be mistaken for an accurate picture of the net effects of environmental policy and employment. And although nearly every controversial environmental policy proposed in the last several years has given rise to a debate about the possible employment effects, the studies used to support either side of the debate are rarely well-executed models, and those debates hardly ever address the model's limitations. The model's limitations, however, are abundantly clear when we compare the reported results. A stark example of this can be found in the studies of two different groups that looked at the effects on employment of the Clean Air Transport Rule, dealing with the interstate, interstate transport of pollution, and um, a rule controlling hazardous air pollution from boilers. The Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst found that 1.46 million jobs would be gained over the next five years, whereas a study commissioned by the American Council for Clean for clean coal energy found that 1.44 million jobs would be lost over the next seven years during, due to the same regulations. Interestingly, these two studies essentially agreed on the number, about 1.4 million. They disagreed only on the sign of the effect. And this is actually a quite common phenomenon. On the left, there are the advocates of green jobs who think that any regulation is going to create green jobs. On the right, there are the people who talk about job killing regulations. And the numbers are obviously preposterous because if you think about it, this regulation, while important, is no more important than many other regulations. There are certainly 100 regulations of this type in the United States, so by the time you sort of multiply the 1.44 million jobs by 100, we would be all unemployed as a result only of, uh, of a number of health and safety regulations. But this is now what passes for analysis in the current electoral process. So when conservatives like Romney argue that the models predicting life saves are unreliable and that instead we should worry about jobs, one has to wonder which job study it is that Mr. Romney finds so reliable. There's probably just another study, equally unreliable, that cancels it completely. Of course, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to understand the various job models, but there are several pitfalls in performing job analyses of which we need to be aware. In April, um, my, my organization, Policy and Technique, released a report that examined the models that are used to predict the employment effects of environmental regulation. What we found was that these models in their current states are very crude and heavily dependent on input assumptions. One problem we frequently encountered in the job analysis we examined was that they conflated short-term and long-term unemployment. Unfortunately, conflating these two measures can lead to incorrect cost calculations and misleading rhetoric. The difference between them should be taken into account when determining the economic cost of layoffs. Short-term unemployment may involve minor costs for job searches, relocation, and retraining, whereas longer-term unemployment can have more severe effects, including long-term income and productivity effects, as well as negative health consequences. 
Long-term unemployment can be driven by a number of factors, including flexible wage rates, technological change, and foreign competition. And long-term unemployment tends to be higher during periods of economic contraction. If an environmental regulation causes layoffs, that effect may be worse for economic downturn because those workers may have a harder time finding a new job. But during an economic downturn, regulated industries might hire otherwise unemployed workers to design, fabricate, and install necessary pollution control equipment. In such cases, where regulatory costs are higher in some respects and lower in others, the net effects of regulation might be ambiguous. Delaying the implementation of a rule might not be the appropriate policy choice. Environmental regulations can also have positive effects on the labor market. They can spur demand in the local labor market by, for example, requiring facilities to retrofit pollution control technology. Analysts and advocates on both sides of the debate should be careful to look at the whole picture and resist the temptation to cherry pick results. Policymakers also will do well to keep this in mind when they're deciding how to vote on bills that would impose across the board moratoria on rulemakings. Finally, economic models used to predict employment effects should be well suited to the type of regulatory effect policymakers are trying to estimate. Such models are better suited to estimating effects in a single region or industry, while others can better handle multi sector or nationwide impacts. We found that models that are best suited for understanding regional or sector specific impacts are often used incorrectly to make predictions about the nationwide aggregate effects of regulation and employment. Jobs analysis cannot replace cost-benefit analysis, but labor transition costs can and should be incorporated into cost-benefit analysis using standard economic principles. The labor transition costs of cost-benefit analysis could reflect relocation, retraining costs, long-term productivity effects, and any negative effects on psychological or physical health resulting from long-term unemployment. If these transition costs are substantial, they may be enough to raise total cost of benefits, making the movement efficient. But this is something that experts and policymakers can do to respond to the political moment, as long as they are careful to acknowledge the model's limitations. Think, for example, of companies that make mercury thermometers. For a long time, it was the only kind of thermometer one could buy. But it was hugely dangerous. These thermometers broke easily, and when they did mercury, a hazardous liquid, spilled everywhere, posing a risk to those nearby that might uh, come into contact with their breathe its vapors. Mercury thermometers are in the process of being phased out by the Environmental Protection Agency. This will create a boom for companies that offer, make other types of thermometers. Those who work for a company that makes mercury thermometers will lose their jobs. Most of them will eventually shift to other companies and find new jobs. Dynamic models take this type of transition into account and arrive at smaller job loss numbers than static models. And it is static models that now have been the focus of the attention of the regulatory right. To some extent, it is understandable that the regulatory right is stressing economic productivity and questioning the models predicting safe human lives. Over the years, the Environmental Protection Agency has largely focused on the mortality benefits of, of regulation, that is, on the number of lives saved, because those benefits tend to swamp all the other benefits, like reductions in sickness. That is mainly because people assign a very high value to work, which is, of course, a reasonable preference. But environmental protections can have a range of other benefits that are perhaps more tangible than small reductions in mortality risks affecting large populations. Healthcare costs, property values, late life illnesses and forced growth retirement, asthma and non fatal heart attacks and cancer, intelligence and cognitive capacity impairments, all are affected but environmental rules. All of these effects deserve far greater attention than they have received so far, in part because they provide current tangible counterpoint to the focus on lost jobs. We do not need to wait for years to see whether the models predicting lost lives are accurate. We can see the consequences of pollution in our hospitals and in our workplaces on a regular basis, and we should be making further efforts to value them as part of the cost-benefit analysis that we have so far. Consider, for example, the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990. It is true that the Clean Air Act, as amended, uh, saves many lives every 
But it also has many other benefits. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, just based on the mitigating effects that the Act has on fine particles released into the air, 17 million workdays will not be lost due to illness. 180,000 people will not have come down with acute bronchitis, and 2.4 million people will not have their asthma exacerbated. Based on the combination of reduction of fine particles released into the air and reduction of ozone in the air, 135,000 people will not have to be admitted to a hospital, 120,000 people will not have to be rushed to an emergency room, and 110 million people will not have restricted activity days, which are days that um, are, are listed when levels uh, go above a certain threshold. Based on the reduction of ozone alone, by 2020, countless school children will not have missed 5.4 million days of school. In fact, these benefits will improve morbidity, roughly equal the estimated cost of compliance with the 1990 uh, amendments, without even having to consider uh, how many lives it saves or its ecological benefits. But even this does not fully capture all, ben all the benefits of the Act. Other than the benefits from reductions in fine particle concentrations of ozone pollution, improved mortality rates and increased ecological benefits, like increased visibility, there are the easily less quantified benefits from reductions in hazardous air pollutants, such as heavy metals and toxic gases, and from reductions in ambient concentrations of other pollutants, such as carbon monoxide. These benefits are difficult to quantify for a variety of reasons, but the Environmental Protection Agency expects a significant cancer-reducing benefit based on the reduction of hazardous air pollutants. And the agency has not even begun to think about how to value other types of benefits. The valuation of ecosystem services is also an important area for expansion. Right now, our methods for assigning value to protecting ecosystems are quite primitive. Often, the most important category of value for ecosystem protection is non-use or existence values. While that is important, it is also quite intangible. But ecosystems provide the basic scaffolding that the rest of the economic productivity is based on. Water filtration, biodiversity, recreation, pollination. Getting the right value is a huge challenge, but also a big opportunity to show what a good investment in many environmental protections are. So a better understanding of non-mortality benefit, non benefits will help the Environmental Protection Agency to make the case uh, that environmental protections are quite often economically justified. In the coming years, the agency should expand its work on the non-mortality effects of its rulemaking to show how, in addition to helping us live longer, a clean environment also helps us live better. And this analysis should have an effect in counteracting what has become this um, very um, single-minded focus on, um, on so-called job killing, the job, job killing impacts of regulation. So here's the conclusion. Um, as I indicated, uh, cost-benefit analysis is, uh, I believe, is here to stay. It's now been the centerpiece of regulatory policy of every U.S. president since Ronald Reagan. And basically, the Reagan executive order, however controversial it might have been, um, has been uh, the um, founding block for the regulatory policies of Presidents Clinton Obama and President um, George W. Bush operating during most of his presidency in the Clinton executive order. So I don't think there's any serious question that this approach will remain in place. Um, in cost benefit analysis, it makes sense that cost benefit analysis here to stay because it provides for a way of balancing a range of impacts on society, counting the good and bad effects of government action. Uh, it is a tool uh, to arrive at reasonable compromises, uh, even in the face of profound ideological divisions. Uh, despite pleas to abandon the technique in favor of some purported alternative, like the precautionary principle on the left or sound science on the right, cost-benefit analysis has proven robust in part because it provides a common ground where all interests are given weight. During a time of deep political polarization, uh, this is why cost-benefit analysis may be more relevant now than ever, and the challenge is to have the various actors in the political process um, understand that. So I think my time is exactly up. <laughs>
and I'll stop here and I'll be delighted to uh, take questions.